Good everyone who is here, and hello to those of you who are on Zoom as well. I'm Joey Lovstrand, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in linguistics here. Uh, and I'm just here to present our speaker for today's seminar, Charlotte Hemmings. So Charlotte did her PhD here at SOAS, and then since then has been doing a few projects at Oxford. So she had a Lieberhum uh, as an early career fellowship at Oxford to continue her work, which was with languages of Sarawak, who had uh, the Borneo side of Malaysia, working with Austronesian languages. And now it's on another project uh, in collaboration with uh, Mary Dalrymple, who was my supervisor, and Marka, an Indonesian linguist at uh, Southern National University, working on this isolate language in Ghana that she'll tell us about still in Indonesia, but a very different part of Indonesia. So, Charlotte, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to hearing about this very interesting project. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for the invitation. It's very nice to be back at SOAS and to be online as well, I suppose. Um, uh, yes. <clears throat> So today, if I could get the slides to work, what, a, what do I press? Okay, um, so in this seminar today, I'm going to attempt to discuss the value and the limitations of using historical resources in the context of language documentation and description, using some case studies of the project that I'm currently working on to document um, the Ngane language of Indonesia. Um, and Ghana is in a relatively fortunate position uh, for a minority language in that it has a rich history of documentation. There are word lists and some textual materials going back to the 19th century, as well as um, a systematic documentation conducted by the German scholar Hans Kehler in the 1930s. And what I'm going to do in the rest of the presentation is to give you some examples of how we've used these materials, firstly, to help in the description of contemporary and Ghana morphosyntax, and secondly, to analyze paths of historical change. And in so doing, I'm going to argue that the historical materials can be of great value to language documentation and more broadly to uh, linguistic theory and typology as well. Um, so how we're gonna get there is we'll start with some background on the Ngano language and introduce the um, historical materials that we've been using. Then look at some examples of how these have helped um, in discussing contemporary, more, um, contemporary Ngano morpho syntax, look at a case study of historical change and then come to some conclusions. And I should say you're very welcome to ask questions at any point if you would like to. Okay, um, so Ngano is spoken by approximately 1,500 speakers on Ngano Island, which is situated off the south coast of Sumatra in Indonesia, roughly where the red uh, pointer is uh, here. It may not be immediately apparent from this map, but it's actually pretty isolated. It's around 10 hours by ferry to the nearest um, coastal town of Bengkulu and even further um, to the, the closest um, island in the barrier island chain that Ngano is part of. Um, perhaps because of this um, geographically isolated position, but mainly due to the relatively and surprisingly low cognate percentage uh, with Proto-Austronesian, there has been some historical debate as to whether this is an Austronesian language uh, or not. Today, most people would probably agree that it is an Austronesian language on the basis that there is uh, cognate morphology with Proto-Austronesian, uh, Proto-Malayo-Polynesian. Um, but there's still ongoing debate as to whether the language subgroups with the other barrier island languages in the chain here, um, and the Batak languages of Sumatra, or whether it forms um, a primary subgroup of uh, Malayo-Polynesian. If we zoom in on the island, you can see that today there are six um, villages where Ngano is spoken all along the north coast of the island. We know from the historical records that previously there were other um, settlements along the um, south coast of the island as well. We also have um, kind of anecdotal mention of dialect variation. Um, by the time we get to Kayla's work in the 1930s, um, he says there's already been quite significant dialect leveling as a result of pretty drastic decline in population in the 1800s and the resettlement of all the populations along the north coast where you're left exposed to the Indian Ocean. Um, today we don't know, uh, at this stage of the project, we don't know an awful lot about the dialect situation in Engano, um, but what we can see is that there's um, different levels of effects of contact with Indonesian. Um, so although the language is considered endangered across the island, the speakers are increasingly shifting to the national language, which is Indonesian, um, the language tends to be more or most vital in the central villages, such as Mayo, um, where there's a larger uh, proportion of Ngano speakers. In the northern and southern villages, there's a much higher percentage of non-Ngano speaking populations, 
um, and this has led to accelerated process of language shift. I suppose so. Um, yeah, maybe we can talk about that a little bit more at the end. It's, it's a very interesting question. Um, so, as I mentioned, there's been quite a wealth of previous documentation on this language. Um, so here are just kind of selection of some of the word lists that um, we have available to us, and you can see some of them are reasonably expensive, I guess. Um, and there's a full list of all the word lists that we know of um, on the Ngano Project website. Just to give you a sense of what it looks, what the records look like, um, this is the Walland list. In fact, the only list um, that mentions here you can see a, a kind of high language and a low language variety um, which may be familiar to you from Javanese or Balinese. Um, no one else uh, mentions this, there's no kind of in our work on Engano we, there's no high or low variety today. Um, make of that what you will. Um, what is interesting is that the contemporary Engano forms tend to correspond to what was Wallen's low language variety. Um, here's another example of a list. Um, this is Healthfish and Peters, and some years later, Healthfish published an up sort of updated version, I guess. Um, as you may already be able to see, there are some kind of differences in transcription, even between the same authors um, and within the same text. So uh, here, if you see um, Baka Kaha and Baka, Baka Uwe, um, these probably both contain the form baka, meaning I, um, but it seems to be spelt differently. Exactly what that means, we have to guess, I suppose. Um, the Healthfish 1916 text also has uh, some texts in it, uh, which is really nice to have these materials going back all that way. Um, and they're published like this. So you have basically the Angana word uh, with a line by line, word by word Malay. Um, translation and then at the end a full um, wow. translation into Dutch. Um, so we have these materials, that's great, um, but there are several challenges if we want to actually use them. Uh, firstly, there's a kind of accessibility challenge, so the materials are translated into Dutch and or maybe Malay in some cases, but certainly not in all cases. Um, they also follow the conventions of um, writing Dutch in the 19th century. So you have to be aware of what those are. Uh, for example, uh, the sound, the digraph or the letter, combination of letters O, E, you're nodding, so perhaps you know this already, um, corresponds to the sound O. Um, so, you know, you have to know these sorts of things. Um, and there's also a question of comparability. So to what extent do the different kind of work, if, if we find variation in the word list, to what extent is this different dialect variation? To what extent is it different practices of transcription? We have to somehow use an educated guess um, to, to make that judgment. Um, and as far as I'm aware, we don't have the original manuscript, so we don't really know what happened between data collection and publication of these resources. Um, the second main historical reference that we have available to us is the documentation by Hans Taylor. Um, and this involves or includes a sketch grammar that was published in 1940. Sorry, I should say he spent seven months on Engano Island um, in the 1930s and then later published um, various resources, including a sketch grammar, uh, a text collection of a variety of different texts, stories, um, including folk stories and kind of descriptions of cultural practices. Um, and a dictionary that was actually published later by one of his uh, or several of his former students um, based on the kind of notes that he'd put together over his lifetime. Um, again, I'm just flashing up what they look like on the screen. So you can see, see here, you've got kind of sentences with the German translation. Um, you've got entire texts followed by the German translation um, where roughly sentences correspond to sentences, but maybe not always. Um, and the things that I've circled are just to show you that, again, even between the resources collected by the same author, there are differences in transcription, um, which may or may not reflect kind of changing analyses uh, of the same phenomena or yeah, who knows. Um, 
So again, we have the same sort of challenges. Really, we have this accessibility at the moment. You have to be able to speak German in order to um, access these materials. Um, there's no glossing, so it's not read readily available for doing the kind of, um, I guess, quantitative studies or qualitative studies that we might want to do. And there's this question of comparability, particularly with the earlier resources collected by um, Dutch administrators. Um, to what extent do differences reflect just different transcription practices? Um, or, or change um, or dialect variation. And again, we don't have the original manuscript, so we really don't know what happened, how the data collection took place and what happened between the data collection and the data publication. Um, so what we've tried to do then in order to limit as far as possible these challenges of accessibility and comparability are to kind of work with these materials and make them as accessible and comparable as they can do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so we've had the materials translated from Dutch and German into English and Indonesian. Um, and as part of the project, we're going through and trying to produce a kind of flex database with um, interlinear glossing for these materials. Um, this is a process that's ongoing, and there are several kind of decisions that have to be made about where we have real um, differences and where we have just different transcription practices. Um, but we're ending up with something that looks a little bit like this, where you can see the texts that were not so accessible become hopefully a little bit more accessible um, for speakers today. So after uh, Kayla, several other people oops, um, have worked on Angano, and it became clear from the more recent publications and from our own initial work, uh, or I should say Mary and Wyan's initial work on Engano, that contemporary Ang Engano has undergone quite dramatic changes um, compared with the varieties documented by Helfrich and Kehler. Um, and you can see a little bit in these examples, um, the contemporary form versus the older forms, where here we might think of the difference between Lopo and Dopo as probably reflecting dialect variation, because we know that D and L tend to alternate with one another. This uh, mo'o is probably just a difference in transcription practice. So I understand that it was common um, in Dutch publications of the time to use the umlaut to indicate two vowels that were separated by a glottal stop rather than a long vowel. Um, here, it's not entirely clear whether this represents a difference or just a difference in transcription. Um, because you'll see that sometimes Helfish uses the symbol O umlaut to represent the centralized vowel that Kayla, uh, at least in the dictionary, represents with the schwa symbol. Um, since these are related, the, the, the root C is in both of these forms, one would expect it might be the same vowel, um, and certainly it is in Kayla. Um, but it's not clear. But it could be that there was a difference in the vowel quality in, in the doc in the variety that Helfrich is documented. So that just is an illustration of cases where it isn't clear um, what to do with it. But what is clear is that the contemporary forms have systematically lost the final vowel compared with um, the, the older recorded uh, materials. So these changes together with the sociolinguistic context um, that I described not very well at the beginning of the talk, and um, provided the motivation for our ongoing um, AHRC funded documentation project. Um, so that's some nice pictures of everyone doing some nice documentation um, in the pre-pandemic uh, world. So you can see, um, Joey already mentioned my colleagues, Mary and Wyan, uh, on I think one of their first visits to Engano, working with uh, local speakers, with um, community members, with local researchers, um, and their training, um, community members to help in the documentation project uh, too. The overall aims of the project are to collect an archivable documentary corpus of contemporary Engano to produce a grammar based on uh, the kind of the database of these uh, glossed texts that we'll uh, collect to produce teaching materials again based on our understanding of the grammar of the language for use in the community and then to assess the position of Engano in the Austronesian family, given this long-standing debate over uh, subgrouping and typology. Um, so data collection had begun before the pandemic started. After the pandemic, we've moved to this kind of newer model of documentation where everything happens online. 
totally unstaged photo of us all smiling happily during every session. Um, and we use these sessions to go through the material that um, had been collected, listen again to the text, and think about what the glossing would be. Um, and as a result of this process, we're building a corpus of gloss text that we hope is broadly comparable to um, the Kayla material. So we're building these kind of parallel corpora um, together. So to summarize what was very long background, um, what we have at the moment is an ongoing documentation project uh, where we want to document contemporary Angano um, and consider how it relates to the wider Austronesian family. We're lucky in that Ngano has a, a long history of documentation, um, including the 19th century materials and the documentation of Hans Kehler. Um, and in what follows, what I want to illustrate is how we've used these older materials to help us in the aims of the ongoing project, sort of as a vehicle for exploring the value of historical or legacy materials more generally. OK, so let's start with some potentially puzzling data that became sort of apparent to us as we started to work with contemporary Angano. Okay, so let's say you have a word like back eye, um, like we mentioned this earlier. Let's say you want to make it my eye. Okay, you could say back oo, oo being the, the pronoun for I, me. Um, but you could also use the suffixed form back up uh, for my eye, back on for your eye, or back there for his eye. Have a look at some more. Okay, the word for house. Well, it's, if you ask a younger speaker like Enger, then it's yum. So again, you can say yum u, my house. Um, but then if you want to use the suffix form, it becomes yuba, yubam, yubde. Another one, yur for head. You can do the same thing, yur u, my head. If you want to use the suffix form, yuru, yurum, yurde. So now different vowels. And then there are some that are kind of just a bit funny, I guess. Um, so yeah, it's hand. If you ask for the word for hand, you can say yeah, ooh. Um, but once you use the suffix form, it becomes up, 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 um, but apparently yeah, day. So what's going on and how might we interpret this sort of messy or puzzling pattern? Well, one of the things that we could do is we could look at the historical resources to see how possession was marked uh, uh, or how Kayla, what Kayla thought, how Kayla thought possession was marked. Um, according to the grammar, at least, possession used to be marked uh, via pronominal suffixes that regularly attached to, um, to the stem. So we can look at this with the example of house, which in the Kayla documentation was uba with the um, noun marker A at the front. So all nouns had case marking in Kayla's variety, which I'll henceforth call Old Engano, just for want of a better word. Um, so you can see Ayuba regularly takes the suffix to indicate the, the, the person and number of the possessor. Ayuba ao, Ayuba bu, etc. Kayla also tells us that suffixation um, triggers stress shift. So it's something like Ayuba bu, uh, Ayuba ao, something like that. Whereas any fetishization with the form dia, die, and do apparently does not. Um, and that's sort of important, so bear that in mind. <laughs> okay, so as, as an initial stage, this gives us a sense of what we might see if it's that. We, we might expect there to be suffixal forms for all of these range of possessors, so we can go and we can work with speakers to see um, if these forms exist. Um, and sure enough, they do. When we went back and we checked with all the speakers, um, we were able to put together a kind of paradigm of possessive markers that is maintained in contemporary Angano. Um, but what you can see is that the kind of connection between the root and the suffix form isn't really as transparent as it was in old Angano. So in um, exactly those person and number combinations where Kayla said there was stress shift, we see this vowel kind of reappearing. So your bam, uh, your bat, your bam, your bat, et cetera. And in the cases where Kayla said it was enclitization, you see no vowel. And that's the same pattern uh, if we look at all of these um, nouns that I mentioned, except that the vowel is a different vowel. So how do we know which vowel it's going to be? What, what do we do with this? 
um, again, looking at the historical materials, the lexical materials gives us a kind of explanation for these patterns, because you'll remember when we looked briefly before, it seemed like the contemporary Angano forms had systematically lost the final vowel. And so this is the vowel that is essentially resurfacing, as it were, in the suffix uh, form. So um, looking at these, uh, the, comparing the lexical items gives us a sense of the regular sound changes that have occurred between um, old Angano and contemporary Angano. The most obvious one that we've already um, noted is that the final vowel is regularly lost, um, but there are certain other processes. So for example, voiced um, consonants are often lenited. So the b is realized as uh, m by younger speakers in particular, um, and d is realized as um, r by younger speakers. So hence, um, there's alternation between yub and yum, uh, for younger speakers, but it's that underlying consonant that it, um, is realized under suffixation. Um, another change is that O splits and is sometimes realized as schwa, which we represent with the symbol, um, hence why we get ap rather than apo. Um, and we see a process of what we might call palatalization of vowel initial roots. We assume that following this uh, noun marker A, a glide was added, so a u a u ba becomes a u ba, just I guess to make it easier to pronounce. Um, at some point, it became optional to have the case markers, and this was lost, but the glide was reinterpreted as part of the root. So, so relatively systematically, you tend to find um, a glide at the at the beginning of nouns now, hence yum, yup, and yap. Um, so that kind of gives us an explanation for what's happening, um, basically where we have these suffixes added and they triggered stress shift, this final vowel is stressed and so it's, um, it's resurfaced, it resurfaces or it is realized in this part of the possessive paradigm, but where there was no stress shift um, and the vowel there would be unstressed, um, it's not realized um, in the paradigm anymore. Um, and this gives us um, exactly the vowel that we would expect from the Kala form is the one that resurfaces in the possessive paradigm. Um, from our initial data set, it was also clear that the possessive suffixes were not the only strategy for marking possession. You'll remember when we talked about my house, we said we could either, either say yubba or yubu. Um, the second strategy with um, the, the free pronoun is, could be considered a contact-induced change since it represents a cult from Indonesian. Um, the strategy that you see there on the right, Uma Aku or Uma Saya. Um, and this strategy most likely developed in response to the phonological changes that affected the regularity of the possessive paradigm um, in Old Engano. So what looked like quite a puzzling data set um, is sort of much more explicable when you have reference to the historical materials. And in fact, these kind of processes of vowel deletion, the what we may call resurfacing under suffixation, and the loss of non-stressed vowels in penultimate syllables, are general processes that affect contemporary Angano, you know, across the morphology. Um, so knowing that these, knowing that a final vowel resurfacing indicated the presence of some sort of suffix can be really helpful in terms of analyzing um, the text that we are collecting now. Um, so again, if you look at kahap, which is an intransitive variant of like, versus kapi, some transitive variant of like, um, maybe the connection between the two forms is, is somewhat opaque. And if we compare with the older forms, oh, sorry, um, in Kayla, at least again, this was regularly a process of um, root plus affixation. Um, so ki plus ahapi would have given you kahapi becomes kahap regularly by the loss of the final vowel. Um, and kapi would have been ki plus ahapi plus um, an applicative suffix he. You lose the final vowel and then you lose the penultimate non-stressed vowel here and you end up with kapi. Um, again, hek and heku, you might think, oh, well, it's um, a process where you add a, a U on the end and this derives something, but different nominalizations have different vowels at the end. And again, this is because this is 
uh, like what, what was a regular suffixation process in old Engano, um, but now you're losing that final um, suffix. And the only indication of a morphological process is the presence of the final vowel. Of course, these may be most likely are lexicalized for speakers. I'm not necessarily assuming that speakers are doing these kind of um, processes online, um, but at least for us going through and glossing the text, it gives us a kind of metric for looking at them. If you can see the final vowel that was there in Kayla, probably there's some kind of suffix that's been added and you can think about what that may or may not have been. Okay, so that was the nominal morphology. And that was relatively simple compared with the verbal morphology. So I'm now, if I have time, hopefully, going to run you through some of the complexities of verbal morphology too, um, and look at a bit more prefixes, I suppose, and think about, again, how the historical material can help us, just simply in analysing the data that we're presented with. So if you ask, uh, if you have a verb root like who, which means run, um, you can derive various different forms of this. Um, and we tend to think of it now as kind of three basic forms, the key form, the boo form, and the bear form. Um, in the key form, you attach key to the root, and then you express your subject via free pronoun, which incidentally for the third person is also key. Um, if you have the boo form, you attach one set of subject agreement markers, um, and the third singular is ka. And in the bear form, you just have the bear root, and then you attach a different set of subject agreement markers. For the third person, it's E. So far, so good. The difficulty with establishing which kind of form you're dealing with on, on any particular occasion is that um, there isn't always a distinction between the three pronouns and the different agreement sets. So for the first singular, for example, the three pronouns, the first set of agreement markers and the second set of agreement markers are the same. Um, and then there are some verbs that don't take boo in the context where we would expect them to take boo. Um, so then the root is kind of the same in both of these contexts. That already makes it quite difficult to know in any given context what kind of verb you're, what kind of an anal analysis you want to give to your verbal morphology. Um, it's made potentially more complicated by the fact that there are several derivational affixes that can attach to these um, roots that begin with an A. Um, and that makes distinguishing in particular between ki and ka quite difficult because if you have a root that begins with a vowel, then you will get the k form of ki. Um, so for example, if you had this form kabari and it, it came up in a text that looks quite like this uh, bu form kabupu, and you could potentially analyze that, I suppose, as the ka agreement plus a b for bu and then a root ari. But it seems like this is probably more likely ki plus this morpheme that we'll talk about in a second um, plus pari. That's basically complicated, is the, is the point that I wanted to make. Um, and so we're faced with kind of these. these texts where we're not entirely sure whether we're hearing, you know, in general, you're trying to transcribe these texts that you don't know whether you're um, hearing them correctly, and you also don't know how to analyze them. What can you do? Well, you can use the historical materials to help guide you um, as to, you know, what, what might be the organizing principles of, of the grammar. Um, so based again on the Taylor grammar sketch and our analysis of the text materials, um, this is what gives us this idea that verbs generally split into three forms, the key form, the boo form, or the bear form. What it, it appears that key verbs mainly occur in relative clauses, um, and they seem to be an innovative structure um, that is found in Ngano and also in Nias, one of the other barrier island languages, um, but not generally found in Austronesian languages of the region. Um, boo verbs tend to occur with a set of subject agreement markers um, and bear verbs occur with another set of subject agreement markers and those are just kind of parallel examples to the ones that we saw from contemporary Ngano a second ago. Um, the grammar sketch also gives us the form of the agreement um, prefixes so you can see um, they differ in the second and the third person but not in the first person. 
and they give and our textual analysis gives us a sense of where the different forms occur that gives us a way of distinguishing between um, a boo context where the verb simply doesn't have a boo and a bear context where we really would never expect there to be a boo um, and so what we find is that boo verbs tend to occur in main clauses where they're typically verb initial and in embedded verbal constructions following various auxiliaries, including um, whole, he, per, high, and um, the negative imperative form, where they occur without the agreement markers. Um, their verbs tend to occur following negation with subject agreement markers of the set two, in imperative, and in clause chains where they often combine with another derivational um, prefix, abba. Um, so, that again gives us a model of something that we could go and look for that might not have been immediately apparent if we had only access to um, the text. We might not have thought even to look for subject agreement markers. Um, but sure enough, working through the context of negation and these contexts where we expect these forms to occur with some older speakers, we were able to um, elicit this paradigm. Um, I didn't really mention this before, but it looks like for some younger speakers, particularly in this context of negation, they're moving towards the free pronoun followed by the negation, followed by a, gen a kind of default agreement marker and then the verb root. Um, and I believe that that is also attested elsewhere in languages of Indonesia that have developed these agreement marking systems. Um, so, Using all this is all by way really of showing that you can use the analysis of the old materials um, to help you decide in a particular context where you have a kind of tricky form what analysis you're going to give it. Um, so here, um, this is from elicitation, I suppose. Um, we know that it's not verb initial, and there's a subject in the initial position. So we're pretty sure that this is where a context where we would expect key. Um, and so we can give it this sort of analysis. Um, and in comparison, here's another case of the same word, but it occurs now in a different context um, where we would expect some sort of agreeing form. I wanted to give you the same word so that you would have a kind of comparison, but I'm actually not really 100% sure if this, if this is the right analysis, but at least it should not be key. It should be the agreement form ka, whether or not what follows it is correct, that remains to be seen. Perhaps this hasn't been very convincing, but what I wanted to show you was that looking at the historical materials can give us a whole load of things that really help us when we're faced with morphologically complex language that we don't necessarily know what to do with. Um, it can give us a guide for elicitation. So it you know, told us that we might expect to find possessive, a paradigm of possessive suffixes and that we might expect subject agreement markers. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you know that hasn't been enough. You know, one study isn't enough, and it sounds like um, if you're talking about historical materials, there could be other kind of gaps in that history that could help you in terms of materials, and you just haven't found them. You mean looking at the older, looking at other materials in addition to Kayla? Yeah, I think that would be the next stage for the project, really, to go back to the other places where we have textual materials and see if that gives us, you know, some extra answers. Yeah. Maybe the answers you were talking about. Yeah. Um, so it gives us a guide anyway for elicitation. It can give us an explanation for the patterns that we find, and it can give us a kind of method for how we might go about our analysis of the contemporary text. Um, and in my opinion, at least, it's quite difficult to imagine how we might have tackled this, particularly given the context of not being able to go to the field and working online over Zoom. Maybe some of this would have been different if we had, had done kind of more traditional field work. Um, but it's difficult for me to imagine how we would have started analysing the corpus without access uh, to these materials. OK, so if I have time, then the next. The next part of the talk is to look at how having not only lexical materials, but also textual materials from various time points can allow us to analyze um, paths of change um, and the impact that this can have. Um, so we've been using the parallel text corpora to analyze various aspects of change. So we've looked at, in, for example, at the increase in lexical borrowings and phenomena associated with language contact. 
Um, we've also explored um, potentially contact-induced changes such as the development of this new possession strategy that I mentioned before um, and shift in word order. So I mentioned that in old Engano, boo clauses were generally verb initial and in contemporary Engano, it seems that they're moving towards an SVO structure, which doesn't help us when we're going back to how we analyze, how we decide what form we have of which particular verb. Um, but today, what I want to focus on for the rest of the talk um, is a kind of case study of a particular construction um, as an illustration of how looking at um, change can have important implications for theory and or typology. Um, by way of background, um, for those of you who are not familiar with Austronesian languages, they are known for their symmetrical alternations. Um, and these are alternations in the verbal morphology that affect the mapping of arguments to functions. Kind of canonical example comes from a language like Tagalog, where you can see the verb takes a different um, uh, marker, the um infix or the in infix, and this corresponds to a different um, mapping between arguments and functions in the actor voice, the actor that's the subject and takes nominative case, in the undergoer voice, it's the undergoer that's the subject and takes nominative case. Um, and the other argument takes genitive case. So we have different kind of verbal morphology, different case marking patterns, um, and this corresponds to different mapping between arguments and functions, but importantly, two transitive clause types, so multiple types of transitive clause. Um, in many languages, the subject has, um, there are various properties that are restricted to the subject, so there can be syntactic reasons why you might choose one voice over another. Um, so if we think about actor voice in particular, um, you can only extract or relativize on an actor. Um, <clears throat> yeah, sorry, if you have, uh, if you if you want to say, you know, the man who's read something, then you can do that. If you have an actor voice clause and you're relativizing on the actor, but you can't relativize on an undergoer if the relative clause is in the actor voice. So you can only kind of relativize on what would be the subject of that embedded clause. Um, and there are also kind of semantic reasons or functional reasons why you might choose one voice over another. So it's well documented that in the more conservative varieties like Tagalog, actor voice has semantic properties associated with, with antipathists. In particular, um, the uh, undergoer argument tends to be indefinite, non-specific, or less affected. Um, and you can see that from the example here in the actor voice, it's kind of construed as hitting at uh, Jose rather than hitting him and making sure that he's definitely hit. All of this leads to a kind of problem in terms of uh, addressing, assessing alignment in these languages, because as you will know, traditionally alignment is identified by comparing a transitive clause with an intransitive clause and seeing whether the single argument of the intransitive clause behaves like um, the A or the P argument of the transitive clause. If you have more than one transitive clause, which transitive clause do you compare it with? If you compare with active voice, it looks like accusative alignment. If you compare with undergo voice, it looks like ergative alignment. Um, so elsewhere, following various people, uh, we've argued that the best way to go about identifying alignment in symmetrical voice languages is to use what we might call a functional markedness approach. Essentially, what you want to do is to find the least marked or the most prototypical transitive clause type and use that to identify alignment. So if your uh, undergo voice clause is the most kind of canonical, or the least marked um, transitive clause in terms of its semantic and discourse properties, then alignment is ergative. And if actor voice is the least marked, then alignment will be accusative. If you adopt this kind of model of alignment in Austronesian languages, then we can, uh, we can make a case for more innovative languages, particularly those where actor voice is marked by a homogenic nasal rather than this um infix that we saw in Tagalog, have undergone some sort of alignment shift via the reanalysis of actor voice as kind of from something more antipathic like to something more active like. Hold that in your heads as background. So the reason I put it, I provide this as background is because although it looks nothing, not doesn't look that much like it, um, the AH construction in Nangano appears to be cognate with this homogenic nasal that we find in many Austronesian languages. 
um, as a marker or as the main marker of active voice. Um, and we claim this on the basis that there is a correspondence between H and Engano and uh, Proto-Malayo Polynesian ng. Um, and much like the homogonic nasal in many Austronesian languages, um, this prefix appears to trigger changes to the initial consonant of the root that it attaches to. Among other things, uh, if you have a root that begins with P, like pari in that kabari example that we had right at the beginning, um, then under um, affixation with this, in this AH construction, you will end up with B or M, depending on whether the root contains nasal elements. If you have a root that begins with K, it will change to D or N, again, depending on whether the root has nasal elements. And this can be understood as a process of nasal substitution, the same thing that we find in lots of Austronesian languages, combined with the Engano specific property of having word level nasality. So um, you basically, you couldn't have a nasal on, on the front of a word that didn't contain any other nasal element. Um, Okay, so now we can use our textual materials to look at how this construction is used um, in, in real data. Um, and what we see is that it behaves more or less like a prototypical antipassive. So not really like an active voice, not, not like active voice at all, like an like a, a morphosyntactic antipassive, um, because when we have the AH uh, uh, prefix, we see that the P is demoted. And you can see that nice and clearly in um, old Engano because it had the system of case marking. So the A marker that we've already encountered was used for direct arguments, that is subject and object. And uh, the U prefix here is used for oblique, mark, uh, oblique arguments. In the context of this AH construction or what we might call antithesis, um, there's sometimes also the generalized preposition e or um, so you can have either just the oblique case marker um, or, or the preposition as well. Um, we, we have some more evidence that it really is syntactically intransitive because Engano has this um, uh, property that in subordinate clauses beginning with a, with this kind of cryptic a, um, you tend to find the boo form of an intransitive verb, but the bear form of a transitive verb. Um, and whenever you have the antipassive form, it's always preceded by uh, boo, in this case, the M Um, So it really is syntactically intransitive, and it also has kind of semantic and discoursive properties associated with antipassives too. Um, in particular, you can see that often um, the P argument of this AH construction is indefinite or generic um, compared with P argument of a uh, or the construction that just uses the bare, the bare root. Um, so these two examples are illustrative. Um, the first one comes from the folk story about um, a woman who gets kind of spirited away by spirit, and then she comes back to see her family and brings them food regularly. And what's important in the context of that story is the action of bringing food. It's not important what food she brings, just generic food in general. Um, in the second example, and this is a story all about preparing for a major festival. Um, and prior to this particular example, um, the, the speaker had mentioned particular types of food that had been collected um, and brought to a location, then said something else and then comes back to it and says, then they take all of the items of food. So it's referring to specific items of food that had been previously mentioned in the discourse. Um, in keeping with the discourse profile of antipassives, these constructions are also relatively infrequent in naturalistic discourse. Um, we had one story that we um, collected a, a contemporary retelling for. In the old, the original version, there were only two instances of this construction in the whole text. Um, and just to put that in context, in the almost 40,000 word corpus so far, or not so far, that's the whole corpus. Um, there are only 507 instances of that morpheme and then a couple more of other constructions that we might consider to be functionally equivalent. Um, and probably about half of these are used in action nominalizations rather than in these verbal antipathic like constructions. So it's pretty infrequent. If we compare this with what we see in contemporary Engano, um, in the text and in elicitation, we can see that the construction is no longer behaving like an antipathic. 
um, it seems that you have a core argument regardless of whether you have the AH um, morpheme or not. Um, and we can tell that these really are kind of core arguments, despite the fact that the K system seems to have um, been lost, um, because obliques and contemporary in Gano are systematically marked with this generalized preposition O oh, that probably comes from EPO. Um, and that's not optional. You can't have that preposition in an in, in, in construction containing the AH prefix, um, but what you can have is this kind of optional direct marker occurring. So by all evidence, it looks like really just a normal, just another transitive construction. It seems like there's a bit of an association with kind of maybe imperfective aspect, which may be kind of, which may be a hangover from an, a previous antipathic like function. And um, so we know that often antipathics are associated with imperfective reading. Um, but you can definitely have a very highly affected undergoer argument, such as a pronoun, for example, a very definite and highly affected. Definite because it's a pronoun and highly affected because it's been pinched. Um, it's slightly more frequent, although maybe arguably not that much more frequent. Um, in the contemporary retelling of the story, there were 13 instances over the two, so that's roughly 4% of verbal clauses, not, not that frequent. But what was interesting and what we'd like to look at in more detail as we kind of build the corpus more, um, in a thesis um, that our, um, uh, um, that Dendi Vijaya um, wrote into 2018, um, we saw that AH constructions were used in you know, more than half of the example sentences that were given as translations for Indonesian Mun verbs containing this nasal. Uh, homogenic nasal form. So perhaps there is some connection between spe four speakers between these two forms that were historically cognate. So more to be done. Uh, and the next step, I think, would be to go back and look at the older text and see how this construction was used there um, and to continue to analyze this um, in the contemporary corpus. Um, but as a kind of mid summary here, um, Lots, a number of Western Austronesian languages have been claimed to undergo an alignment shift as a result of this reanalysis of something from antipassive like to active like. In Engano, we see very similar process of reanalysis. An antipassive doesn't look like an antipassive anymore, but what about alignment? Well, neither old Engano nor contemporary Engano appear to have a symmetrical voice system. Um, instead, the morphology that was previously associated with voice um, that is the choice between bu cognate with this um infix that we saw in Tagalog and bear forms potentially from an embedded undergo voice um, appear to mark a kind of tense aspect mood distinction instead. So what once marked symmetrical voice now seems to mark the distinction between what we might call realis um, and irrealis in that this construction is largely limited to uh, following negation um, and imperatives. Um, there's also no extraction restriction. So that kind of act to pivot function of the active voice uh, doesn't, isn't linked to boo versus bear anymore. Um, so if you imagine Tagalog, if you wanted to relativize on the actor, you'd have to have your active voice form. And if you wanted to relativize on the undergoer, you'd need the undergoer voice form in your relative clause. That's not the case in Engano. It's not that you need boo if you relativize on the actor or bear if you relativize on the undergoer. Instead, you use this new key construction in all relative clauses. Um, so no evidence of a symmetrical voice system, and instead lots of morphosyntactic evidence pointing towards accusative alignment in both old Engano and contemporary Engano, including the fact that the verb indexes F and A in both of those different agreement sets that I mentioned, and the fact that S and A seem to function as a pivot in terms of relativization, because when you relativize on F and A, you use this key form in the relative clause, but if you relativize on O, at least when it's um, a, a full NP, then you tend to use a nominalization construction instead. So this would be something like the woman, woman that is the one who was seen by our father, you. 
Consequently, Angano appears to be accusatively aligned in both old Angano and contemporary Angano, but it does still seem to have undergone this kind of reanalysis of what looked like an anti-passive as something more active-like. Um, and this suggests that this process of reanalysis can occur independently of alignment shift. Um, it's probably the result of the particular developments in the prehistory of Angano that led to those various functions of active voice, the metrical voice alternation, the act of pivot marking and the object of motion semantics being split between three different constructions, the VU form, the key form, and this AH construction. Um, but either way, it reveals kind of really interesting set of possible developments in Austronesian voice um, morphology and provides further support for the idea that antipassives are particularly amenable to historical change independently of alignment shift and kind of most unusually for in the Austronesian context, independently of symmetrical voice. So um, what I hope to have shown you then is that the historical materials not only help in kind of guiding the documentation and the building of the documentary corpus, but also enable, to enable us to analyze paths of historical change, which isn't always possible with underdocumented languages, but can have important implications for our wider understanding um, of linguistic theory and typology. Um, hence, they make an important make up an important part of achieving the kind of goals, the wider goals of the project to assess the place of Vengano um, in the Austronesian family. So that's it for me. Um, what I want to conclude by saying is that Engano is um, has a rich history of documentation and is relatively fortunate, I suppose, in, in the relatively fortunate position of having parallel text corpora from the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. Um, the historical resources are limited in ways that we've discussed and present challenges in terms of their accessibility and comparability, um, especially since we don't know what the data collection process and publication process really involved. Um, and there's a very interesting paper that you may or may not have read, um, which um, looked at exactly the difference between kind of published older records and going back to the original sound recordings and the original manuscripts and the kind of editing process, I suppose. Um, so do read that paper. However, they give us an important window into what is, I think, quite a morphologically complex language, providing an explanation for puzzling synchronic patterns and a method for analyzing new texts. Um, as well as analysing diachronic change um, with potentially important implications uh, for Austronesian and for typology. Consequently, I would argue that historical materials can be very useful in the context of language documentation and description, and that making these materials accessible and comparable for future research can and should be an important part of producing transparent um, and contextualised records of a language. So that's it, just left to thank the community, um, the various people working in the project have contributed in various different ways and the funders and, and you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. We've got as uh, much time as you want to stay around and ask questions for. We can stay and ask questions. Uh, so we'll start with people in the room, but if you're online and have a question, you can write in the chat where your question is, or you can use the raise hand function. Or just make a note in the chat that you want to ask a question we'll get to you so now for here does anyone here have a question or constructive comment for our chris yes oh uh, thank you so much charlotte really nice to see that thank you so, so i'm very sorry for the beginning i'm sure i'm going to this world of important stuff um I, okay so i mean i thought it was an absolutely fantastic talk uh so I really hope this question will come across as well. But um, speaking as, you know, I really can't call myself a field linguist. I just feel a bit confused by um, the, the way you present this idea of uh, using the historical materials as much as possible. You sort of present that as possibly surprising. <laughs> but, uh, as in, as in, it's sort of obvious that you would do that. Is that what you're saying? From from my perspective, which is, you know, far less, um, yeah, with no expertise on this sort of sort of documentation whatsoever. I mean, you know, I would. You please tell me where what I'm missing and where I 
you know, what's wrong about this, but I, I would just, I would assume, I would sort of say, okay, well, this is a language which is poorly documented, but, 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 it, but it's documented. Documentation has all kinds of flaws, and one of the flaws is it's old, and therefore we can expect some amount of change, yeah. but there'll be other flaws like poor analysis or uh -huh. whatever. Yeah. So just to summarize the question for those online, Chris is wondering, Sorry. why do we have to argue for using historical records for this kind of work in the first place? Isn't that obvious? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess you're right. And maybe you don't need to argue. Maybe maybe what I wanted to show was how you could use them rather than that you should use them. Um, I think sometimes people can, would say, oh, well, you know, we, we, can't, we can't do anything with these materials, so we'll just focus on what we have, the data that we have available to us. And I guess the point that I wanted to make was, although it's taken a really long time to make these materials accessible in some way, I think it has been really worth it because it's enabled us to do all these things that we might not have done otherwise. But maybe it is, maybe it is already obvious. Uh, yeah, I wanted to echo that, but it does take a lot of effort. And so the question is, is it worth the effort, but also do funders care about this kind of thing? It's not very sexy for funders to go like, reanalyze old documents. So how do you argue for why is this essential to this bigger picture of documenting languages and understanding these um, other Another question? Um, yeah, um, I think one of the main points was that you don't normally get this much um, historical material from this. So why do you think it's this particular language is not a primarily for you? That is a good question. I don't really know. Um, so just to repeat the question, why why is Ngano so well documented compared to a lot of minority languages that haven't been documented? Maybe historical accident. I know that Kayla did do quite a lot of research in that area in general, and I think perhaps he wanted to do something else and then ended up on Ngano Island, so it may be such a historical accident that he happened to work on that particular language. Um, I don't know. It, my experience working in Sarawak was that there were really been not very many historical records at all. And what existed was kind of word lists of maybe 30 words or, you know, not, not very much at all. So I found it very unusual to have all of these historical materials available to me. But it may not be actually that unusual. But that, that I don't know. That would be an empirical question. Another question here? Um, yeah, so it's more about Ngano itself and the mm -hmm. Um, But you mentioned in contemporary Ngano, um, their form is generally used with irrealist, and you mentioned negation and comparatives. So I was just wondering if it's also used for, say, hypotheticals or uh, some conditionals as well. I don't know about conditionals. That's a good question. Um, how would you do that? What I know is that it's used in those contexts. So following negation, you will always get either that default E or one of the other agreement markers plus the bare form. And if you want to form an imperative, there are actually two ways of doing it. One way you just use the bare form. I mean, that's normal, I guess. Um, or you can use the boo form plus, you know, a second singular, a second plural agreement form. So there are two kind of strategies for marking imperative, really. Um, and then there are all these clause chaining constructions where you get the first verb is in the boo form, and then subsequent forms are the bare form with often with abba in front of it. Um, that I don't think you can really call irrealist, but maybe you could think of it as an embedded construction. So it, when they're just there's just one verb and that verb is either boo or bear, then it is kind of a realist, a realist construction, but it's not quite as simple as I maybe made it sound. It's, it seems to me like you had, you had these forms that originally marked a voice alternation, and then they are inherited in some way. So you have this choice between boo and bear, and it's not marking voice anymore because it doesn't, you know, the choice of the bare form definitely doesn't mean that the undergo is the subject, but they just kind of turn up in different contexts that may be somehow linked to an earlier function of voice marking. My guess. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, 
I'm just chucking a tiny comment there. Go on. There's, um, there's a good paper by Roger Lass, How to Do Things with Junk. And no. this concept of exaptation when uh, morphemes lose their original function, they tend to be exacted, or whatever the word is, to, to a new function. Sounds like that's what's going on here. That sounds like my analysis of what's going on here, whether or not that is true. I don't know. How to do things with Joe. Yeah. Okay, I will make a note. I did not bring a pen, so I'll have to use my phone. Well, let's see if I have a question. I mean, on, on, on this on this same or that, I think because because it might well be that it's done, but but I, mean, I was still a little bit curious whether you can push further what it is that's happening. But I think that you have shown very nicely that it's not very little change if it's not alignment. Yeah. But then but then it may well be something different. And the reason I'm asking is and, and we had this discussion before that part of Austronesian language is tantalizingly close to Bantu language. It's like most things are close to Bantu language, but it's a bigger thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's the way it's achieved. Uh -huh. So we've been struggling for a long time in Bantu, what do we do with the causative, the negatives? Um, and then and then the standard analysis was that it's syntactic, so you have a bigger different valency, and that's a little bit like the alignment chain. But then you have lots of functions where you have the morphology, but it's, it's not syntactic. And now I think more the people are thinking back to that the syntax is a function of something else, there's something deeper going on, which has to do with like semantic or you know, with pragmatic equation factors. And the syntax is then one reflex of it. So then, then from that perspective, the question becomes is it the case that what you are showing actually is quite the opposite to the leftover repurposing, but but rather the original function. something, but actually. You have a that's better access to what is underlying these these mm -hmm. the alignment shapes, which then are no longer alignment shapes, but reflects of something else. But then the question becomes what is this something else? Yeah, I mean that is very plausible. That really, you know, always we tend to think of it as well, what's in the Philippines is the older thing, and everything else has changed from that. Mm -hmm. But it's especially given how isolated Engana is, it's possible that it preserves some kind of earlier pre-symmetrical voice type system it's totally possible i don't have a good answer for what it is if it's not that um but yeah something to do with tense aspect mood maybe maybe i don't know that's what, that's what it looks like I mean, it's more, more semantic it's yeah just related to historical change. I don't know what I'm basing it on, but this seems like a lot of change for a 100 year period. I don't know if it feels the same way. I'm wondering, like, so does that have to do with, you know, was there a more complex dialect situation or levels of language, or were there pre Austronesian groups there, which of course would correlate with the lexical change being totally different? Do you think there's other things that were going on that have influenced this huge amount of change that we've seen? Yeah, it's really a lot of change because it's probably two or three generations, right, from the 1930s to today. Um, and, you know, the words look really different, largely because you've lost this final vowel. Once you factor that in, it's not. But then you get these other changes, like the, you know, the age construction. Um, I don't know why there would be so much change in this particular context. Is it somehow to do with the fact that there has been a lot of language contact? Um, there are, I, I don't actually know what the relative proportion of Angano speaking people to non Angano speaking people on the island is, but, but um, I think there are lots of people who don't speak Angano on the island. Um, the vitality is much less than some of the other languages in the area. Um, according to the most recent census, at least. So can that have something to do with the fact that there's lots of change? Yeah, I don't know. But definitely it looks like a lot a lot of change to me. And I, But why would language, I mean, this is the general question, why would language contact lead to losing the final vowel? I mean, there's always theories about who are, are there other people learning this language? As a second language, I have other influences they're bringing with them. 
but that's always the third day that it happened. Lucy, do you have a comment on the third day? I actually have that whole page of comments. There's two talks in one. It's really nice. Thank you. And, but on the, on the particular on the vowel one, it reminds me of, of Hawaiian passives, which work a little bit like that. So the Hawaiian passive completely doesn't analyze all these random vowels, which makes it possible. Uh -huh. But what, the, what you have to do is you have to say, well, the passive is the original one, and there's nothing to analyze. And the active, and that's the vowel. The active is the one you lose the final vowel. Uh -huh. So, so that you know, so so the wider question then is methodologically what do the what do the characters? Because because they, this this funny having strange vowels showing up in, in lost in places where you don't expect that it looks a little bit like Nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Very possible. Very possible. Okay, then let me let me. Oh, and then I, and that goes back to Chris's question, actually, which I think is interesting. And the question why do we have so much documentation? And that, that's why I think I think what you're doing is really interesting. It's actually different from maybe more, more well-known scenarios of old texts, because it's such a strange as collection context. These are all colonial contexts, right? These are little German and Dutch missionaries and anthropologists going there. And they come with a very clear expectation of a language is like. And they, they, have, they are all trained in Latin and they, you know, they, are, they are trained for high school music. Mm -hmm. So maybe what you get in the description actually is an idealized version of what, you of what the language should look like in the view of the missionary. So, so in, in, in Southern Africa, there was the famous hospital Kruler. Kruler comes from Cologne, but very good English. Now he went back to Southern Africa and found out that all the Khoisans, because they couldn't speak that Khoisan and Vishnu Hopani, <laughs> didn't really quite understand how good well. So then he had to describe his own version of what he thought Khoisan should look like. And that he really writes that. It's very sweet. That, you know, he doesn't mean that. But of course, you can see the mindset behind it. So, so maybe what we're looking at there in the whole description is some sort of ideal of what it ought to be like if it was Latin or based on Latin. So the change you see is partly artificial because it never was that way. But of course, partly it's also real. So, so that's why methodology is so interesting, I think, what you're doing, because, because it's a very unique sort of thing of documentation, global south, your know, partial description type situation, which is so difficult to tease and untease. And then and then party could ask, you know, you could, you know, I guess the program very nice you've done that, but but the project could ask you who are these people like you know, Kayla, you know, when you did do other things. But you know, Demford, I think, is a big Hamburg Australian person. How did he end up there? What was the preconceptions? Why did they go to this place, not the other? So it becomes that you know, a very thick description almost, which in part might then shed light on very different structural aspects. Mm. Yeah, I think that's another way of making the materials accessible, isn't it? The kind of background to those projects and I think that would be very useful. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Just very narrowly on the final vowels thing. I mean final vowels if they drop, that's what they do, right? But but the point is how do they drop? Uh they they drop uh gradually starting in and they grow speech and you know they they don't they don't have the vowel sounds that they have in Latin. They don't have the vowel sounds that they have in Latin. Building on Lutz's point, you know, maybe Kayla was you know describing Maybe maybe final vowels in the variety he was claiming to document, as it were, uh, already were very often dropped. Uh, but you know he preferred. But he to, wrote to them write down. Full forms. Yeah. You know, when when they're when they're speaking carefully, you know, it's, it's a possibility. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty likely. I, I did have another question. Um, just a sort of quite a small round of question. Um, yeah, forgive me because I forget the contents, but you you talked about um, functional markedness or other markedness. I just uh -huh. wondered, I just wondered what, what exactly the criteria that is for that. Criteria. Yeah. Um, what can you remind me of the concept? I'm sorry. In relation to assessing alignment, it's yeah. looking specifically at the okay. domain of transitive clauses. Yeah. So the idea is that, you know, a transitive clause, according to various people, would have. Um, particular semantic properties. So the unmarked one would have those exact properties and anything that varies from that would be marked in some way. Um, also in terms of discourse, you know, it would be the most frequent one in discourse. It would have particular discourse patterns. So there were some kind of met metrics for it, setting that. Okay. But functional rather than form. So 
um, it wouldn't rely on a kind of formal definition of transitivity, but rather semantic or discourse definition. Yeah. That hasn't really answered the question in detail, but. No, yeah. no, no, no. I guess I've just become slightly allergic to the remarks. Oh, yeah. Um, I think, um, yeah, if you, yeah, yeah, you could, I don't know, I, uh, do you like prototypical no, better? I, I mean, people are really, I I, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I had also encountered that people were not, necess marketness wasn't very fashionable, but it seems like a nice little term. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think the point is, I think the trouble is often people use it as, to say something very vague and possibly ultimately meaningless and clearly that's not the case with you but but in in, in the other cases like your case it, it it breaks down to some 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 precise criteria yeah um, maybe the criteria are the wrong criteria but there were a set of kind of criteria no, for, and reason, you could see like, a difference like frequency for it is one yeah. the obvious one then yeah. you might very you might want to supplement that with that and you need a term and mark. Yeah, I mean, I guess people still use it. Yeah. yeah. Just a way of choosing between one or other of these constructions, really, for the purpose of deciding what your alignment should be. Yeah. yeah. Double check, there's no questions here online. Let's see any questions from anyone online. Were there any final questions from anybody else here? Uh, just kind of building on what was said before regarding the historical documentation. Yeah. Thinking about uh, what you said about uh, missionaries and their like previously notions of how a language should be. I know something similar happened with a lot of uh, Native American languages, and they were documented in a way that actually I think changed the way they worked, like down the line. I just wondered if maybe you said it's like a lot of change in a few generations within this language. Um, if maybe the uh, historical documentation could have triggered some of those changes? I don't think that speakers would have access to these materials because they would be in Dutch or in German. Um, so I don't know that they could have had the kind of the sort of effect that Sorry. you're describing. These people documenting them maybe were traveling and maybe carrying some of these notions with them that they had previously documented to parts where the language was slightly different, it might have influenced something. Hey, maybe. My sense is that a lot of the changes are making modern Engano more similar to Indonesian, and that therefore it's likely a kind of contact effect of Indonesian being the national language and also um, you know, local varieties of Malay and that the local languages Minangkabau that are kind of important languages of regional communication and all have these kind of Indonesian type structures. So my sense is that a lot of the changes that you see in contemporary Ngano are probably tied to contact in that way more than an effect of the, the earlier documentation. Uh, could it be possible that um, these historical documents were not that accustomed or not that used to Engano? So maybe some of the sounds that they were documenting, they couldn't distinguish between several points that they maybe saw in the development? Yeah, that's, that is really tricky when we're looking at the historical resources, particularly when there's a difference between. So recently we've been we've mainly worked with the Kayla materials and recently we've been trying to kind of incorporate the, the earlier health fish materials too um, and it is really challenging to work out what is just a variant just you know we're not represent Kayla represents a glottal stop with an apostrophe we assume everywhere he heard it but that's an assumption um, and health health fish sometimes represents a glottal stop with a Q and sometimes that, well, well, in cases where Kayla has one, he doesn't have one. Is that because he assumed if he wrote two different vowels next to each other that there would just be a glottal stop added? Um, and so there's no need to write it. Um, or was it not there? Are there two different strategies for having the vowel sequence and dealing with, with that? Um, yeah, in terms, of, so yes, I think it's entirely plausible that the, Kind of native phonologies of the people documenting the language 
affected the way that they transcribed the text. I don't know, the Kayla documentation seems very systematic to me. And almost always when we have the contemporary form that corresponds to the old form, it corresponds exactly. And I don't know whether that is because I'm using the historical, I'm so familiar with the historical materials that I then hear it in the way that I think it ought to be pronounced based on that, that is possible. Or whether it was just, you know, pretty systematic documentation. Um, yeah, if we could, there are, we, we know that there are manuscripts of the Kayla material and various people have, because the, um, when, when the, the dictionary was published, there's mention of having seen these manuscripts, but we don't know what happened to the manuscripts. So kind of the major aim of uh, our lives for the last however long has been to track these manuscripts down in the hope that it might tell us something. Um, whether that will be possible, we don't know. Yeah, I, it's a good question and I don't have it. It's very hard to tell, basically. Okay, we're going to go wrap it up there. For now, anyone who wants to continue discussing is free to join them afterwards as we'll just take the discussion elsewhere. But let's say thank you to Charlotte very much. Well,